Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Adrian Murahung, and I am both bassoonist and interim executive director of the Talia Ensemble. And I'm here today with Sam Yulsman, composer who is being uh, featured amongst other composers in our Written for Talia program on Saturday, March 12th at 7.30 p.m. in Cary Hall at the Domena Center for Classical Music. Um, so first off, I wanna say, Sam, thank you for being here. And um, thanks for taking the time to chat with me a little bit about your music, about thanks for uh, having this piece. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. and, and your piece in particular and, and your and the collaboration with all the musicians involved in this piece. Um, so yeah, thanks for being here. Um, yeah. I'd like to I'd like to start off in just um, kind of letting you speak to us a little bit about your your music and composition approach in general. And, um, and I'm very curious uh, after discussions that we've had previously about some recent uh, developments in your compositional style revolving depiction. And um, I was curious to just, you know, let you uh, speak to us a little bit about, about these ideas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, part of it is, you know, a very simple idea, just that writing or composing a piece, you know, responds to a moment in life or a place um, that you are in life, you know, and that could be like a, a physical place or emotional space, you know, all sorts of different kinds of places, but that writing comes out of that. It comes out of life in a kind of direct way. Um, and so, yeah, when I've been thinking about depiction recently, it's sort of thinking more analytically or directly about how the sounds relate to you know, that sort of source of inspiration from where the music is coming from. Um, and yeah, I mean, because that leads in all sorts of different interesting directions. And I think, you know, the other cool thing is there's a, there's a really, I would say legendary, important, tr like American tradition of depictionism in music. Um, which I think really starts with Thomas Wiggins, um, who was a slave composer um, in the 19th century, uh, who among other things invented tone clusters um, and really predated Charles Ives. Um, but that tradition I think is something I've been thinking a lot about recently too, you know, how you can comment on life which seems like an obvious thing, like obviously all music does, but I think in the classical tradition, oftentimes, you know, there's, you know, people talk about like abstract music or music that's somehow like leaving life behind or something, but it's been interesting to sort of tie what I'm doing and think about what I'm doing through that tradition with Wiggins, Ives, I would say Duke Ellington, Muhal Richard Abrams, um, yeah, and also like, you know, someone like Frederick Jeffsky too. So those are, yeah, the, that's the piece that I wrote for you guys and, and me and Jesse Cox. I think, you know, it's part of this new way that I've been thinking about things. Yeah, and actually to, to add to that, is there a particular event or something, a, a part of your life that led you, because you mentioned this to me recently that, you know, this is something that's changed recently and it's something that you feel strongly about. Was there a particular moment that you kind of attribute that to? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about a particular moment per se, but I think the past, well, it's interesting, maybe like moving to Miami and leaving New York, I think it gave me some time to sort of think about what I had been doing in New York and kind of the broader trajectory of my musical output which really started with jazz like that's how I came up um and trying to tie things together so maybe it wasn't a moment per se but actually like a or a moment of reflection let's say um the past two years where there hasn't been you know a lot going on because of the pandemic um so I think it came out of that sort of reflecting on things um which is actually part of the piece because I did some of that reflecting on Biscayne Bay, um, yeah. which, as perhaps you know, is, is a very beautiful spot to uh, to think about things. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, you know, uh, growing up in Miami, 
I spent many, many a warm day it on Biscayne, like uh, either in Crandon Park off of Key Biscayne, um, various parts of, uh, I think you, you refer to the Western part of Miami Beach, um, viewing yeah. Biscayne Bay, uh, crossing all those bridges. I have a lot of fond memories of, of that mm -hmm. setting. So I'm curious to hear more about that. Um, so speak, you know, as we're talking, you know, slowly inching our way towards this new piece, um, I'd like to dive into that a little more. And um, I kind of, uh, you know, uh, Voided Sky, Endless Bay is the title of your new work. And I kind of, I want to read a short little uh, tidbit from the program notes just to kind of uh, give a little insight to, to our listeners and let you kind of take us further into this world that you've created um, from these locations. And um, you say that uh, Voided Sky, Endless Bay describes two places, the sky of Front Range, Colorado, so thin it seems not to exist at all and the calm waters of Biscayne Bay, felt from the west shore of Miami Beach. The piece weaves these impressions together as memory often weaves into the current of the senses, reflecting them through sound into each other until water and sky become an image of one another. A kind of bay of sky, as Edouard Glissant writes in A Field of Islands. I find that intriguing from multiple directions because um, you know, I'm curious about Edouard Glissant and this, and particularly a field of islands, and how your experiences in Colorado and the mountains, and Miami with the water, and uh, influences and inspirations from Glissant's writings all come together in this piece and create a, a particular sound world. I'm curious to hear how that happened. Yeah, absolutely. Being in Miami and starting to read his poetry. He has a very beautiful way of connecting the landscape. You know, on, the, on a surface level, it's like metaphor, you know, the sea stands for something else, but there's, there are these thick webs of association that um, sort of connect to your, you know, I thought of it as connecting to one's soul or to one's innermost being. And there's this way where you're connected to nature, you're not cut off from it. Um, you know, like some other poetic traditions, like European traditions, there's this idea you have to get past yourself in order to get to, to nature, or get to what really matters. But for him, we're sort of already there. And that was a powerful idea um, from, yeah, to think about that in musical terms, um, just that, you know, you're sort of this sense of already being able to connect, you sort of just have to, to let it happen. Um, but also, I would say, sort of connecting landscape, um, connecting memories of, man of landscape um, to sound or to like a kind of structure of feeling in the sound. Um, so that's, that's all kind of abstract, but I would say, you know, from, those, from the other angles of Colorado and, and the Biscayne Bay, for the Colorado angle is pretty... Um, important because I grew up there. So I have all these memories of the sky there and sort of how that makes you feel because it's when when you're actually there, it's there's something very unique and special about how you have this sense that there's nothing in between you and whatever you're experiencing because the air is so thin. Because you're, you know, they say a mile high. You're so you're so high up in the air. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, this kind of sitting on the bay reflecting, but then noticing how the the image of that type of sky sort of interrupted, you know, reflecting in the moment um, in Miami. So to me, it's this kind of weaving of the two, uh, which I think is it's related to a lot of things, but um, definitely like how I conceive of time uh, coming from a jazz tradition where the past, you're, you're constantly, recycling the past in order to create the future, um, which is one way to think about improvisation. So it goes out in all sorts of different directions. But I would say, I mean, the interesting thing is almost hard to speak about to me. And I think that's what I wanted to, I want the music to be able to sort of speak to something unspeakable in the landscape. Um, and I think in Glissant's poetry, 
it's there's this interesting sense of the language putting into words something that you can't put into words which is sort of a paradox but i think i think of poetry that way you know it's more about the way you say something the music perhaps of it um but so i'm i'm no poet i would say <laughs> so it, it's hard to put those things into words but i would say that the job of the music is to um yeah, make that accessible or at least create a space where the audience can experience something, even if it's completely different. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, and I could say even just from the, the, the rehearsals we've had so far, it is, um, it, it, A, I'm happy to be within this piece myself uh, performing. And um, it is an interesting experience to feel the music in a way, especially like we're today, for example, in our rehearsals, we were spending more time doing run-throughs of sections or if not run-throughs of the whole piece um, to get that indescribable effect that the music can have on the performers or the listeners um, that we can't really describe in words. So I'm kind of connecting with a lot of what you're saying, this idea of like, you know, music is a universal, a universal language when we can't find the words to say things. And um, and hearing you speak about your time in in Biscayne Bay and and Miami in general, speaking actually to both this piece and what you said earlier about uh, your your changing or evolving ideas about composition and music, um, the past couple of years, obviously, we've all gone through a lot of hardship with the pandemic, mm -hmm. and um, and I think there's been a question that's come up often with composers is asking how does the pandemic or these couple of years and all the obstacles we've gone through, how does it affect, uh, you know, what, what composers are writing? And does this all tie in together for you with, you know, like you said, you had a lot of like self-reflection in Miami. Um, can you speak yeah. to that a little bit? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's interesting because, yeah. Well, I think for me, a lot of the things I was writing before I was, I was kind of obsessed with getting inside of the of gestures, you know, the gestures that produce sound. So I was doing a lot of tablature notation, um, which was interesting work. Um, but I think I got to a place, I got to a place with it where it, I don't know if it didn't work anymore, but I definitely felt like the the pandemic was a, a chance to sort of rethink all of that. And for me, it was, I don't know, trying to, maybe it's simple or something, but just trying to connect to the sound and the vibrations actually, um, instead of getting into the nitty gritty of uh, the gestures themselves, which have vibrations you could say of their own. But I think it just came out of this desire to like feel, feel vibrations actually with other people in a room. Um, so I think, I think that led to it. And as you know, like the notation for the piece is like pretty simple, at least on the surface, but it's been interesting for me to play the piece. It's surprisingly hard for me for some reason, even though it's very simple. So that was an interesting thing to think about a little bit. Um, just that, you know, the exact amount on the ink, ink on the page doesn't equal complexity, which is of, of course true, but you know, sometimes hard to realize, especially if I you're in this world agree. Of, of like gesture world, so. Yeah. Yeah. No. Definitely. I. I could. I could. I. I definitely see that from our rehearsals. It's you know everything looks pretty clear and straightforward. The ink on the page, and yet it's a whole sound world that we just need to take time to explore. Exactly. And I think that's what's some that's really special about this piece is that um, you know, every little um every little building block, in itself, can seem almost insignificant. But once they all come together, it really the beauty of the piece comes out. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I kind of I want to touch upon also a couple of things you've mentioned uh, already, which is uh, your collaboration with Jesse Cox. Yes. Yeah. And um, and I want to just ask you a little bit about that. Is um, it seems like you you have a history of collaboration now. This is not the first time you two are working together. And I um, how did that how did this collaboration begin and what kind of projects have you done in the past with Jesse and how has it been to, to kind of work together on this piece in particular? Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think when I met Jesse, 
it was either 2018 or 2017. Um, I think we just met at a show actually. Um, but then we started playing together a lot, like, you know, every week or more. Um, so we were improvising a lot together. Um, and then we had two different collaborations, one with uh, amazing saxophonist and composer Roman Filiou. Um, and we both wrote some music for the trio. Um, and then we had a long standing, it's still going on um, with string noise, uh, the amazing violin duo, um, Conrad and Pauline Harris. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, those were sort of the first things we did, which were, you know, I would say based around improvising, but also also writing for those smaller groups. Um, but then when the pandemic happened, we started, we kept collaborating, but in different ways. So we created a website that you could improvise with. That's interesting. You can you can go there, anybody that wants to. It's called Weaving Music 2. <laughs> um, Weaving Music 1 was an album that we released um, together. That's on uh, Gold Bolus Records. Um, and yeah, that was kind of a documentation of our improvising, playing, composing. Uh, and then, yeah, Weaving Music 2 was more conceptual. It was kind of thinking about during the pandemic, like how to, I would say, like find liveliness and find life. And maybe even like I was talking about vibrations, um, even if they're a different order of vibration, but try to get past this sense of virtualness, you know, that we feel on Zoom. So we were trying to do that with a website and the concept was, and it's related to Glissant actually, like his idea of opacity. So if you go there, it's a very confusing website. You have to do a lot of work in order to find things. But the reward well, we is there. Just, yeah, yeah. You, you know, the idea is you, on the internet, things are sort of transparent. You always know where you're going or you know where you want to go. So mm -hmm. we were trying to, you know, mess things up in some way where you have nice. to approach it in a different way. Um, we did that and then we uh, wrote an essay together um, about about the website and it's, yeah, it's connection to a lot of different things, but Glissant's writing actually was important, his idea of creolite. Um, and then I would say improvisation um, and I would say, yeah, a, a lot of different things, but sort of trying to connect that to a lot of different traditions. So Afrofuturism was an important one. Um, we saw, sort of saw it as a Afrofuturist website. We connected it to Code Will We Shun, which was, so that was, that was another part of our improvisation, which was kind of scholarly. Um, and then, yeah, then we didn't, we haven't been doing something for a little while. And then this piece came up um, and Jesse, recently released an album which I don't know I forget the title of it but he he did this amazing solo album all with um, Bode Symbol um, and so that kind of clicked for me to to put that together uh, with what I've done for Talia in the past and try to like blend these worlds together um, and mix them so yeah, it sort of comes out of that long, you know, long collaboration that we've had together. I wanted to ask, like, how did or when and how did improvisation come into your life? Um, and how has it evolved your practice of improvisation? How has it evolved over the years? And do you generally incorporate it in a lot of your writing? Um, and, you know, if you could just speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, honestly, I would say improvisation was there from the beginning. Um, I would say probably for all of us, that's kind of a, maybe a political point of some kind. <laughs> I would say maybe more directly, you know, I, I, I probably when I was 12, I started playing jazz and that was really what I wanted to do. So I, there's a great, uh, really great organization, the Colorado Conservatory for the Jazz Arts that I was part of, led by the drummer, uh, Paul Romaine and his wife, Chris Romaine. Um, so I spent a long time, yeah, coming up with them and 
playing with like the greats in in uh, Denver, Colorado, where I grew up. Um, and another important, like really where I got into free music was through Art Landy, who's a amazing pianist, composer, theorist in his own right, um, but he's from Boulder, Colorado. And I started studying with him, I think when I was 12, I was, I was pretty young. I, I heard him on the radio and I was like, oh, I gotta check that guy out. <laughs> um, <laughs> nice. So yeah, that, that was important. Um, it's really been there always. Um, and then, yeah, I went to school for jazz at uh, University of Miami for one year. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, yeah, in, when was that? 2009, 2010. But then I made my way to Columbia um, and I was studying with uh, Jason Moran and he mm -hmm. said, you gotta check out George Lewis. So I knocked on his door and was like, there you go. And I study with you and, and <laughs> George has been amazing, amazing teacher. Um, and improvisation has always been a part of that. Although I would say um, we mostly dealt with composition in our lessons. Um, so, I mean, we, we dealt with both of them for sure. But for me, always think, you know, always thinking about these traditions, not as separate things that can't go together, mm -hmm. but um, yeah um so and you know a lot of that a lot of that led to this you know really trying to improvise with notation and get really deep into it into the complexity of notation i think came out of being you know from a jazz tradition um and it's been interesting to see how that shifts from there so cool well i think um we're slowly running out of time for for our chat today but i want to thank you once again for taking the time to speak with me about all these great topics and um and i repeat that uh voided sky endless bay will be performed saturday march 12th at the at carrie hall uh, in the Domena center for classical music um and i also want to thank the Fromm foundation for their general uh, generous support of this piece and the uh, commissioning of the piece so sam thanks again uh, for chatting with me and I'll see you at the concert. Okay, thanks so much. <laughs> okay.